bit of a change from what we've just heard a talk uh, heard about, and we'll be moving a little bit back more towards um, what Martin has talked about um, and chemistry. Um, I, I, I was asked I, I, to talk particularly about the area of photocatalysts for um, solar driven hydrogen generation. Um, and of course, in keeping with the theme of this symposium to focus on organic and polymeric photocatalysts. Um, so I'll talk just very briefly about the motivation for this field and then I'll talk about two examples of um, polymeric or carbon based photocatalysts, um, um, carbon nitrides, and then I'll go on to conjugated um, polymer photocatalysts, including some of the examples of polymers which those of us who work on organic solar cells will be very familiar with. And um, because it's me talking, I'm going to be talking about charge carrier dynamics because that's what I, I love to talk about. Um, in, in terms of the motivation, then we've already heard about <coughs> solar cells and photo detectors. Um, the particular motivation here um, is to make fuel from sunlight and um, most obviously to make hydrogen. Um, it was very interesting to hear today, for, for, or to hear a couple of days ago, the UK government's announcements on um, green hydrogen um, or, or hydrogen as part of a green industrial revolution. Um, the, the particular interest here is can we um, design materials which can directly harness sunlight to split water into hydrogen and oxygen, where that hydrogen then can become an energy vector and indeed a way of storing renewable energy. When we think about um, the materials which are um, interesting for trying to, to, to um, split water or make hydrogen, then most research to date has been on metal oxides. And you can see some examples of a top here of a metal oxide photoanode for oxidizing water, a, a particulate photocatalyst in this case for oxidizing water and reducing CO2, or effectively a, a berry junction type structure here where you had a cuprous oxide absorber and then you're filling oxide on top to reduce photons to hydrogen. Um, and indeed, this is a very active area and an exciting area of research. But of course, we understand that organics have advantages, um, most obviously in their tunability, um, generally in their processability, but maybe carbon nitride is not the best example of a processable material. And indeed, now there's an increasing amount of interest in using carbon based materials to achieve similar functionalities of harnessing sunlight to make fuel. Maybe the simplest example is to take an organic solar cell, just as the sort of devices which we heard Kuhn and Martin talk about earlier, but to replace the top metal contact with a catalyst. And in this case, if you uh, replace the top metal um, in a PIN structure um, with ruthenium oxide, then this can be a, an electrode which would act as a photocathode to reduce protons to hydrogen. That's indeed a very interesting area of research. It's not something I'm going to talk about particularly um, this afternoon. I'm going to focus more this afternoon at um, suspension photocatalysts. So the idea that you can have a material in suspension where you shine light on it and you reduce protons to hydrogen. Ideally, you'd want to oxidize um, water to oxygen. That's much harder. And so typically we are, we are driving organic oxidations. Some of those are useful, some of those are not. I'll come to that a bit later. Um, there are many now examples of carbon-based materials as photocatalysts. One area is carbon quantum dots. And, um, but I'm gonna focus um, in my talk particularly on carbon nitrides. And then at the end of my talk, the second half of my talk on conjugated polymers. So carbon nitrides is not something which I think many people in the CPU will be so familiar with. Um, but they, carbon nitrides are made um, by a rather simple um, thermal synthesis, much simpler than anything which Martin would have talked about earlier. Um, most easily, you can take urea, which is not exactly an expensive material, and you simply um, heat it in a furnace, um, and you end up after some washing um, to get to, to, to structures like these, these heptazine rings, which gives rise to a semiconductor though certainly not a very conductive semiconductor, which forms a, a powder absorbing um, in the blue. This powder um, has, a, has a bang gap that rather nicely straddles the water oxidation and reduction potentials. And indeed, this sort of material has been used both to split water, to oxidize water, 
and to reduce protons, both as electrodes and as particles. Most of the work in this area is around employing it as, a, um, as particles for proton reduction. This is now an active area of research, and so I had a quick look on, on weather science, and um, there's around about a thousand papers a year published on carbon nitride photocatalysts. So it's becoming a very significant area of research. And the most, and the most classic example of application is the, the, the carbon nitride is a light absorber. Something is used to take the whole away, ideally an electrode, more typically a chemical, and then the electron goes on typically to added platinum to act as a catalyst to reduce protons to hydrogen. My own interest is trying to understand the photophysics. I should also note, of course, this is a material which is not that processable, nor is it very tunable, which is why we'll be talking, and it's also highly defective from this very simple synthesis. Um, I'll talk about that in this talk. Just to start off with a basic charge carrier dynamics. So if you photo excite some carbon nitride suspension, you observe um, a decay of the optical signals of the charges, which um, uh, most of the decay happens on the ultrafast time scale with a time scale of tens or hundreds of picoseconds. Um, this decay is, is uh, accelerates at high carrier densities, and we think this decay is primarily associated with uh, um, the, essentially the direct generation of charges, which then undergo um, rather fast bimolecular recombination. The role of excitons in carbon nitride is rather poorly understood. But if we extend the time scale out to the microseconds to seconds time scale, then you can see there are quite large optical signals which extend out to milliseconds and seconds in this material. And these exhibit the classical dispersive power law decays indicative of, of the recombination of long-lived trapped charge. Indeed, you can see in these ultra-fast timescales, not all the signal decays on the, the timescales of a few nanoseconds. And so this is a material which you know, behaves rather similar, rather, sorry, rather differently to a conjugated polymer, but more similar to a metal oxide in the sense that photoexcitation generates charges and those charges can very easily become trapped. And of course, then understanding the role of that charge trapping is critical to understanding the function of these carbon nitrides. We initiated some trying to understand the impact of charge trapping some years ago with um, a, a postdoc in my group, Robert Godin, who tried to map out the energetics of this charge trapping. And the way we did this was by plotting the decay of the population of the charges by their transit absorption, but then um, correlating that with the decay of the emission from um, charge, uh, from, from um, the emissive initially generated states, most obviously um, reformation of an exciton from the charges. And by tracking the emission and the population as a function of time, we could calculate an equilibrium between the emissive states and the charge states. And what we observed was that initially after photo excitation, um, but the states are rather shallowly trapped and so you have still lots of emission. But as the carriers um, trap into deeper and deeper traps, then the signal from the emission starts to decay and it decays much faster than the overall decay of, a, of the charges themselves. And so we were able to use these data to quantify the energy loss associated with trapping. And indeed, we observed here that in this particular example of urea-derived carbon nitride, that something like two electron volts of energy was lost in the deepest charge trapping. And of course, we started to then to understand that, of course, uh, electrons and holes with 2 EV of trapping are useless in terms of function. And the key was to try and get the carriers out of the carbon nitride into a catalyst before we lost too much energy to charge trapping. But we can do chemistry to change that trapping. And if you change the substrate from urea to melanin, and then you functionalize the surface with NCN, then our colleagues in Cambridge, Erwin Reisner, were able to show that the long-lived electrons um, could retain their activity to drive proton reduction. And so in this case, you can see that if you um, take your, your um, carbon nitride and you add a whole scavenger, in this case, um, this, this um, benzyl alcohol, 
then you can generate long-lived electrons which live for seconds. And these long-lived electrons are able to pass on their electrons to a, a proton reduction catalyst, in this case a molecular catalyst, to make hydrogen. In other words, this material still generates long-lived uh, trapped electrons, but these trapped electrons are now energetic enough to drive catalysis. Interestingly, of course, here what we can also see is now we're driving a useful oxidation. So this is a, um, an alcohol going to an aldehyde. This aldehyde is more valuable than this alcohol. This idea that defects can be useful is not just observed in carbon nitride. This is an example of a study which we've done on tungsten oxide. Now the defect was oxygen vacancies. And what we observed was that the optimum function was at an intermediate function of oxygen, density of oxygen vacancies, where for, for an intermediate concentration of oxygen vacancies, around about 2% oxygen deficiency, gave us the most photocurrent, gave us the most long-lived charges, and indeed the slowest ultra-fast recombination. Indeed, also in organic solar cells, there's been some suggestions that charge trapping can aid charge generation. Personally, I suspect that charge trapping is the poor man's way to aiding charge generation, but if you can't um, design well-defined junctions, then traps can indeed help you to stabilize charge generation. But I suspect for anything particularly efficient, and indeed there's now increasing interest in the idea that in really efficient organic solar cells, you don't want charge trapping. As an example of why charge trapping can be a problem, um, we, we, we were doing a study looking at the impact of electron accumulation in these charge traps. Um, when electrons accumulate in the, these, in the, in these, um, uh, these long lived electrons, which can drive function um, in these carbon nitride, the sample goes blue. What we observed is that this blue correlation co corresponded to a rapid acceleration of recombination losses in the carbon nitride. And so here's an example. We had a small laser spot. Um, in the laser spot, the sample goes blue if you don't stir it, and the decay gets much faster. As soon as you stir the film, you now move the, um, the reduced material away from the laser spot and the, car and the car dynamics go back to a long time scale. And so this is an observation that if you accumulate too many electrons, of course, those electrons can act as recombination sites for holes. And this had a direct impact on the intensity dependence of performance. And so we observed here that as you up the light intensity, the hydrogen evolution does not increase linearly with light intensity, and we attribute this to this electron trapping. And then we're able to show if you had a, a redox relay to take the electrons out of the carbon nitride more quickly, then this nonlinearity became less severe. So this is all suggesting that the traps maybe help the charge generation in carbon nitride, but you need to be very careful about their energetics. And if you have too many long lived electrons, then things don't work. I'm going to move on to the, to the rest of my talk, to talking not about carbon nitride, but about the sort of beautiful conjugated polymers which, um, and, and acceptors, which Martin talked about earlier. Um, these are materials where the synthetic chemistry is somewhat more challenging than heating up urea in a furnace, but at least allows you to synthesize materials with much more precisely defined structure and much lower defect densities. This is an area which was really driven initially by um, the Cooper Group in Liverpool, which synthesized a large number of both linear and porous polymers. And more recently, in the Cullex Group, um, with a rather more delocalized location, um, where, where they've been using some of the more classical conjugated polymers, um, which we're used to thinking about in organic solar cells, both as homojunctions and indeed as bulk heterojunctions. I'll just touch on, first of all, the linear polymers. From, from, from Andy's group. So we did a study here, for example, comparing, but uh, trying to understand the structure function relationship, where he had a series of polymers where he increased the proportion of this sulfone group, sulfone group in the polymer. And that was observed to substantially increase the yield of hydrogen from that photocatalyst suspension. And we wanted to understand why that was. And what we observed was that this um, increase in sulfone content accelerated the hole scavenging by the TEA, because of course we can understand these are now excitonic systems, conjugated polymers typically generate photoexcited excitons. These photoexcited excitons um, will typically decay on the time scale of 100 picoseconds or less. Um, if you add the sulfone group, then this 
um, appears to accelerate the ability of a molecule like TA to take the whole out of a conjugated polymer on a time scale of only 10 picoseconds. So it can, can compete effectively with exciton decay. And indeed, when you do this, you're able to generate long-lived electrons which drive the reduction of protons to hydrogen. Interestingly here, if you don't have any whole scavenger, you don't have any significant signals on long time scales because these materials have far fewer traps than that carbon nitride. So you really have to have something to separate the exciton. Traps don't do it. Um, in this case, it's a, a, um, a whole scavenger. This whole scavenger is clearly not ideal, but at least it enables it to function. A rather more elegant way, which we understand from organic solar cells to separate charge, is not to require a whole scavenger to work on a picosecond time scale, but to employ a bulk electro junction. This is an example of work from Ian's group, which has shown that if we take materials which are going to be familiar to many of those of us interested in organic solar cells, and we process those as nanoparticles in suspension, then we're able to drive the, um, the separation, uh, the, the, the reduction of protons to hydrogen using visible light, because of course the beauty of these sort of conjugated polymers is now that we can extend the optical absorbance from the blue where the carbon nitrate is absorbed right out to the visible region of the spectrum. And indeed these materials are showing a markedly high performance, um, still not ideal, but certainly, um, certainly very promising. We're just beginning to understand the photophysics of these materials. And so you can see, for examples here, these are the red and the, the, the green and the blue are the exciton decays of the donor and acceptor. And the red is the blend where we can start to see long lived charge generation. What's already obvious if we compare a nanoparticle in water compared to dry films, but the photophysics changes. And so the, exciton decay, the excitons are shorter lived in the nanoparticle but in the films. And indeed, we get significantly more charge separation in a film than in an adder particle, which is one of the reasons why this particular structure isn't working yet so well as efficient as a solar cell. Why photophysics is different in water compared to films is something which is um, not understood. But of course, water is a, a far more hydrophilic, a hydrophilic and polar environment. And that probably has a significant impact on the difference in function. The last thing I want to touch on is the role of metals in these photocatalysts. When people first started synthesizing and reporting function with the conjugated polymer photocatalysts, um, it was not obvious whether they needed a metal to achieve function or whether the photocatalyst, the, the polymer itself, was catalyzing proton reduction. In the carbon nitrides, we know we need to add um, a metal to achieve function, but in these conjugated polymers, it wasn't clear. Um, again, Ian's group um, took a, a rather classic polymer, um, which um, I imagine G cell would rather like, F8BT, from, uh, from a days when she was worrying about light emission. Um, and, if, uh, and the beauty here is that um, you can use um, uh, chromatography to remove the, the metal content of a polymer like this. And as you do this, you find that its function as a photocatalyst plummets. It was clear that you needed and, and of course, the metal here is a metal which comes from the synthesis in those reactions which Martin talked about earlier on um, this afternoon. And so if you take out the residual catalyst from the synthesis, then F8BT no longer works. We've been trying to understand why that is and what's going on. And so we can see some photophysics here, for example, of um, F8BT particles where well, um, as a function of palladium content. And what you can see is if you don't have any palladium, you see long lived electrons sitting on F8BT in the presence of a whole scavenger to take the, the holes away. But F in the unpurified material, the electrons don't sit on the F8BT, they sit on the palladium. This is the spectra of, a, of reduced palladium, um, which is clearly showing that those um, the, 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 in this system, the electrons end up on the palladium to drive the proton reduction. Rather interestingly, this palladium has quite a large impact on the photophysics. And so, for example, um, when you purify um, the F8BT, the exciton lifetime doubles, which is clearly indicating that the palladium is quenching the excitons in this polymer. That's 
um, relevant for these photocatalysts. It may also have wider relevance for organic solar cells and photodetectors because most of the materials which we use in, these, in, in our solar cells and photodetectors have not been purified to take the metal out of that material. It's also clear that this quenching by the palladium was not fast compared to the whole scavenging. Whole scavenging of this material is two nanoseconds, not 10 picoseconds, because there's no, um, this is a hydrophobic polymer, no cell phone groups to aid that whole scavenging. Maybe most relevantly, if we compare the function of the P10 and F8BT, then of course, the, um, the improved whole scavenging by P10, this is my, much my last slide, uh, Nicola, so I'm gonna be ending soon. Um, the, 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 the whole scavenging is far more efficient for P10 because of their cell phone groups, which enables far more long lived electrons. And that's why P10 works better than F8BT. Though, of course, neither of them work as well as those bulk edge junctions I showed earlier. Um, but when we look at where the electrons go, it's rather striking the electrons in a typical F8BT unpurified go onto the, the palladium. In P10, they don't, they stay on the polymer, even though. This P10 polymer has more palladium than F8BT. And we've understood this because um, the P10 um, is rather a poor electron transport material, at least that's the most likely understanding. As we change the palladium content in P10, which is much harder to do because it's much harder to process, it's not, it's not a soluble polymer, then the kinetics of this electron decay change. And so what we imagine is that these electrons are decaying by electrons finding their way to a palladium to drive the catalysis of proton reduction. But that happens rather slowly compared to the actually the time scale of the proton reduction catalysis on a palladium. So I hope I've given you so, uh, so, um, some thoughts about why polymers are interesting um, for as photocatalyst materials. I must finish particularly by thanking all the group who've, who've done the work and particularly my, my past, um, past and present group members and all the various collaborators we've had both for materials and for modelling. And with that, I will leave you, if I can, with some conclusions. But um, it seems that carbon-based and, uh, and polymer materials are working better as photocatalysts than I think anyone expected. Um, and they're showing quite promising stabilities and efficiencies. Their function, however, is very poorly understood. And there's clear differences between how we can understand the function of something like carbon nitride, oh, sorry, and um, a more classical conjugated polymer. These um, are far less tunable, have far less traps, those that, that have far more traps, that trapping aids charge separation, aids the generation of long lived charges, but of course it loses energy. And trying to modulate those traps is the key to the function of the carbon nitrides. In the polymers, the problem is the exciton. With conjugated polymers, just as we understand so well in organic solar cells. If you want to get something useful out of conjugated polymer, you've got to separate your exciton. And that's not always so easy. Um, one pathway is bulkhead junctions, and that I suspect is going to be the pathway which we're going to see much more work on going forwards. With that, I'll finish. Thank you.